Well, welcome back, everybody. Hope everybody's well. This week, as you can see from the stills, we're back in a car museum again. This is the Australian National Motor Museum. I can't think of the suburb. I'll put the suburb's title on the screen here in a second. It's in South Australia. It's the biggest car museum in the country. And as you know, Kaz and I are into this kind of thing. We mentioned it on the last clip. Well, uh, we're looking at another one. But this one's got a lot more modern vehicles and things in it, so it may be of more interest to you. Anyway, if it's not, I'm sorry, but uh, Kaz and I are into that. We like to show you everything we get up to, so hopefully you do enjoy it. So sit back, grab yourself a beer or some other beverage or whatever you like to do while you're watching my clips. It might be too early in the morning, I don't know. Anyway, you guys sit back, enjoy it, and we'll see you a little bit later on in the clip. Cheers for now. Hi, we made it to the National Motor Museum in South Australia. Let's go have a look. Let's check it out. I'm sure there's all sorts of very cool things in here. BP Bullet. Land speed record. Ah. March 91. Wow. I don't think I want to sit on that, to be honest. Lamborghini 2010. And you have 2008 Bugatti Veyron. Now, most of you guys that watch my channel can probably afford to have one of these, so I don't know why I'm showing you this. I actually reckon Terry from Jaffa Adventures will be buying one of these in the next couple of weeks. I'm pretty sure he'd be all over that. He strikes me as a Veyron kind of guy. Very nice cars, isn't he? And I haven't even made it in 10 feet yet. And for all the troopy owners, this is how you paint up the side of your troopy, right? That's how you do it. If you've got a troopy and it doesn't look like this, get onto it. Want a feel like worldy? <laughs> Travel around in this Rolls Royce, which has carried exactly that. Royalty in Australia. Up at the top in this museum, you've got a section of what is or was production line at GMH. Now obviously it's up a bit higher in the air here than it would have been at the factory. But that just gives you an idea just what part of the production line would look like. Nineteen forty eight Holden number one. Wow. That's impressive on its own. The automotive industry was already well established by the outbreak of the Second World War, but still no car had been mass produced in Australia until Holden built the 48 215 in 1948. This car was the first off the production line and its resounding success paved the way for almost 70 years of local car manufacturing. So this is the very first Holden. Nineteen sixty XK Falcon. <laughs> Needless to say, being the National Motor Museum, there's heaps and heaps of stuff in here. He's not taking away from Gilbert's museum at all. But of course this is the national one. This is E.G. Cruz Marie. Tom Cruise was the mailman in Outback Australia. Not that Tom Cruise. This Tom Cruise. And that's a six-wheeler truck that he had. 
Now, I haven't read the whole information, but there's plenty of it. It's a lot of info about EG Cruise. So, I won't push along too much with that. Another beautiful old Holden in here. There's some fantastic old cars in here, seriously. Are. So, I grew up with Holdens. Kaz is a mad Holden fan. And that was, this is my favourite here. Yeah, this, this one here. WB Stady. WB Stady. Kaz's favourite ever car. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't matter if she's got a 200 series, lots of grunt. More grunt than this <laughs> station. No, 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 no. She'd rather have this Stady. Oh, look at that one. Yeah, I'm getting to that. And they were cool cars in their day. But still. Yeah, yeah, guys, a Tirana. Not the kind of Tirana you used to seeing, is it? Well, oh, there it is. Tirana Badger. Three point six V six twin turbo. Six speed manual. I don't know if they released these, but it's pretty cool. Monaro, of course. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. Interesting. This one. Twin hatches to get into it. And the Sandman blast from the past. Oh, here we go. That's a bit of a thing. I reckon I could lose my license in that pretty easy. And just to prove, guys, apart from this beautiful late model scene there, just to prove that they've got everything here. Yes, it's a Magna. Frightening, isn't it? A lot of beautiful old cars over there. I'm not going to be able to show you everything, guys. So... Maybe you sort of understand that. Old fire engines. This section is mostly Holden. And here's, here's a Holden that bloody I've never seen. I don't know how many others would have. But it's a Holden. Yeah, look at that. That's mad. I'm going to move you in there, guys. There we go. Yeah. I'm going to read about this because it's just mental. Two thousand and five effigy, winner of the two thousand and seven North American Concept Car of the Year, is possibly Holden's most admired show car, representing both the homage to the classic Holden FJ, the Humpy Holden, and a nod to custom and hot rod design. The effigy was an instant hit. It's a 6 litre Gen 3 supercharged V8 of 4 speed auto. Place of manufacture, Holden by design, Fisherman's Bend, Victoria. That's just no. This is a full scale size Lego Camry. And it's hybrid too. It's petrol and electric. How sweet is this? It's all made of Lego. There is so much to see and read here at the museum. 
Totems, Fords, Bucatis. Oh, so much to see. And so much history on them. that everybody wants to see while we're here is the mighty Leyland Brothers Land Rover and of course I know that all you guys who are watching this want to see this one so I better show you Milo Many of us have seen many, many DVDs with this truck in it, including the last of Rufy's videos where you see it driving down to bring it here. So there it is, in all its, I don't know if you call it glory, oh, it is glory. but it's been around, it's made history, it's made a lot of history. and here it is. And Ruthie donated it to the museum, so he's not going to ever get it back. Uh, and I remember the tears on his face when he parted with it here. So, there you go. Milo 1. Part of history near National Motor Museum in South Australia. And a G60 at Graham Cale would get excited about. And of course a 40, 40 foot so that uh, Sean ain't get excited. So everyone get excited here. That of course is all the parts that we four drivers wanted to see. So I probably won't do much more talking now. I'll just go back there. Wandering around looking. And anybody who followed our trip in 2018 that brought us down to Murray Bridge and then up to Darwin, well, we're passing through Murray Bridge again today on our way down to the Limestone Coast after the museum that we've had a look at, the National Motor Museum. So, Murray Bridge is pretty well in flood, so I'm just going to show you if I can get any kind of footage at all of how big the water is in the river. So I'll see what I can show you. But I'm not placing a lot of faith in it, but I'll show you what I can. So a lot of this stuff is closed off because the Murray is seriously in flood. And I mean seriously. I don't know how much far I'm going to walk down here. But it is very, very, very flooded. Extremely flooded. Yeah, that's um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty flooded. They've done a good job of making sure, but well, it's not so much making sure. Everything's okay, but buddy, it's very, very deep. So they're trying to keep things closed off. A lot of water down there. Well, I don't know if I've got any footage from 2018 to show you. I've made it down the river. In the background here you can see the flood level 1956 sign. So it's pretty deep because that's it right next to the where I'm standing. That's about a 
two feet the landing. So there's a hell of a lot of water passing through here. I won't, I won't let you out on the jetties, which is not surprising. Because the jetties under. Because <laughs> most of the jetties underwater. So, yeah, it's a very, very huge amount of water. So yeah, and the rain sort of was a while ago, but everything here is still seriously flooded. Well, good morning everyone. Today finds us in Meningi, just down the uh, southern part of South Australia alongside lake called Lake Albert on the limestone coast. Now it's very windy this morning and I'm also staring at the sun as you can see but we're going to go for a wander up to look out and have a look from up there and see what we can see. There's Kaz in classic lookout stance. And hopefully the wind's not blowing me away too much here guys. You can see out over the town and over Lake Albert the first day on our South Australian trip, it's actually not stinking hot, but it is windy to make up for the not being stinking hot. Now I'll just move you around this area. Apologies for any wind noise guys, I'm speaking close to the mic as I can. It does give you a look over the farmlands, pastoral area. It's not a very high lookout, but it doesn't have to be. Everything around here is so low down. So, you don't have to do much. I was going to throw a drone up, but I think it's actually just miles too windy for that. I'll lift you up further into the sky. Now in all seriousness, that's about as much as there is to show you from the lookout here, so Kaz and I will keep wandering around and see what else we can find around the region. Well, we're still getting blown away with the wind. We've come out to Point Malcolm Lighthouse. Lighthouse operated between 1878 and 1931 to mark the narrow passage between Lake Albert and Lake Alexandrina. Alexandrina. It also served as navigation aid for traffic on the lakes. Isolated farms, homesteads and settlements were dependent on the steamers and other boats for supplies and transportation. Fishing boats, sailing vessels and cargo steamers regularly plied the waterways. Travellers between Adelaide and Melbourne sailed across the lakes by steamer to reduce the long road trip. By the early 20th century, the paddle steamers Jupiter, Malang and Murray were carrying passengers, goods and mail up to three times a week between Malang, Narung and Meningi. The light station, the Point Malcolm Lighthouse and Keeper's Cottage were constructed by Richard Trenath, a well-known builder from Strathalbyn. The tower is seven metres tall and was first operated in February 1878. The original white light revolved every 10 seconds. It used seven gallons of mineral oil per month and had a visibility of 10 miles. In November 1887, the lamp was altered to a fixed white light. The keepers were self-sufficient and even sold extra crops. crops. They stored the perishables in a small cave under the boat called under a boat called to transport them to settlements. The lighthouse was turned off in September 1931 
because of a decline in vessels using the lakes and automatic light poles installed to guide commercial and recreational traffic using river and lakes. So there you go. Anyway, it's um, blowing a gale. It's a little bit of a walk, but what the hell? I'll go and have a look. It's kind of funny, I wasn't expecting to walk through a bit of farmland to get to uh, a point of interest. But there you go. Anyway, I'll see you up there. Right, so wind and all, I've made it up here. The ferry is working today. I wasn't sure what was going to be going on, but anyway, that's the view over the lakes. This is the new modern light solar power that they use now. And here is the lighthouse. I'm on the wrong side for the sun, so give me a tick. Sorry about the wind, guys. It is stupidly windy up here today. So I really apologise for that. But... Here she is. Not huge. It's natural trust, natural trust registered as you'd expect. And it's a piece of history in the area. That's pretty good. So, uh, like I said, it's not a big structure, but it did a good job over the time. So, anyway, you probably can't hear me. I'm getting blown away. Get over here. <sighs> Hopefully it's a little bit less windy, guys. Anyway, as you can see, I'm standing at the White House. So, I'll walk back the half a K or whatever it is back to the truck. Ah, anyway, it's all good fun checking out this stuff. Been a lot to show you driving down the coast for a little while. It's been windy and the lakes and the waterways have been horrible. But as you know, Australia has an obsession with big things. So we've come to the town of Kingston and here we have the big lobster. So I thought I'd better give you a look at the big lobster because, well, it's big. So you've got to check these things out, haven't you? Not to mention, it's about lunchtime. So Kaz and I are gonna have something to eat. But, yeah. That's a big lobster. Wrong time of the day for all the angles. But, he's a big sucker. I'm not sure what else I can tell you about that other than he's a big lobster in Kingston, South Australia. That is the Cape Jaffa Lighthouse, which has been relocated. I'll tell you a little bit about it. The Cape Jaffa Lighthouse was originally built on the Margaret Brock Reef, eight kilometres out the sea from Cape Jaffa, and 20 kilometres southwest of Kingston. Margaret Brock Reef is named after Margaret Brock. Bark shipwrecked there in 1852. Built to protect ships from a similar fate and allow safe access to Lacapede Bay or Lacapede Bay or whatever, however it's said. Work started on the 41 metre structure in late 1968. Sorry for the wind guys, it's still windy down here. And it was completed in January 1872. Staffed continuously by two lighthouse keepers, it's 142,000 candle power light showed at a distance of 40 kilometres. 
1973, a new lighthouse at Robe replaced the Cape Jaffa Lighthouse thanks to the work of Vern McLaren, the National Trust of South Australia, Kingston South, South East Branch, and local volunteers, the old lighthouse was presented to the National Trust South Australia for relocation to Kingston. So there you go. From 1974 to 1976, there followed a mammoth undertaking to dismantle the lighthouse, move all its parts to land and reconstruct it on this site. So there you go. So we'll go for a quick look and see what we can see about the Cape Jaffa Lighthouse. I can't see any Jaffas, so it's no good to you, Terry. And Jaffa Adventures, there's no Jaffas involved. But it's a lighthouse, it looks pretty cool. And you can, well, you were supposed to be allowed to get up there, maybe you had to pay for a tour to go up there. Awesome sign saying paid tours with this much. I'm feeling a bit tight today, so I'm not getting a tour. Apart from that, I don't want to wait that long to go for one. Pretty impressive. Do you like lighthouses? So if you're in Kingston, in South Australia, on the Princess Highway, go and have a look at it. Olivia lifeboat. While we're at the lighthouse. This lifeboat is from the MS Olivia, a bulk carrier that grounded off the Nightingale Islands in the South Atlantic Ocean at 4.30 a.m. on the 16th of March 2011, whilst on voyage from Santos, Brazil to China with cargo of 65 226 tonnes of soybeans. The lifeboat was launched soon after daylight, a precautionary measure, but broke free from the MS Olivia due to rough seas and drifted away. At 2.30am on the 18th of March, MS Olivia broke up with 1,500 tonnes of fuel oil and all the soybeans on board, creating a severe environmental damage around the Nightingale Islands. February 2013, this Olivia lifeboat washed up on the beach in the Coorong National Park, about 73 kilometres from Kingston, southeast, after drifting over 8,000 kilometres halfway around the world from the Nightingale Islands. This Olivia lifeboat was retrieved from the beach, cleaned and placed here by volunteer labour and donation. So there you go. Long way from where it got uh, break free. That's the Olivia lifeboat. So a lot of coastal stuff, historical stuff to check out around these kind of towns. But, uh, I must apologise again for any problems with the audio because of the wind. Now, we're going to keep cruising around and see what else we can find. Well, what you're looking at here is Cape Jaffa. And yes, it's still stupidly windy. And we drove down a track before it got too sandy. But this track will get you out onto the beach. I don't know where you go when you get out on the beach. But oh boy, we parked a bit further up where we weren't having to drop our tire pressures down. But um, when I got out of the car, I was wishing I had some bush barriers on it. But oh well, made that call for this trip, so that's how it is. Anyway. If you do plan to come down here to Cape Jaffa, either don't be too bothered about your paint, have a wrap, have some bush berries, do something, or um, don't come down here in your truck. Anyway, we'll go uh, trudging back through this sand, back to where we've parked the car, and get out of here.
today finds us somewhere on the road to Narcourt, I think it's Narcourt or Narcourt, something like that. But before that, we're heading to, what's the name of that town, Kaz? Oh, I don't know about the town, but we're heading out to uh, Moon Lagoon. Moon Lagoon, which apparently is a very significant wetland. It's uh, heritage listed, globally recognised. So it's um, something to see, I suppose. We've got no idea what's going to be there, of course, but it's known for its bird life, which doesn't particularly worry us too much. But we're uh, we're going out for a look anyway. But the interesting part is, at the present time, we're driving on dirt. We haven't been on dirt for a few days. And of course we're driving on dirt the day I choose to wash the car, but anyway, that's life. And uh, having a bit of a look around, it's pretty well maintained dirt actually, so it's not throwing up much dust, so it's not too bad. Now the trip has had a few weird and wonderful twists so far, so I thought I'd let you know what they're about. We've had absolute gale force winds the last couple of days, so that's forced Cats and I into motels for a little while because there's just no way in the world we could set up out in that wind. And um, it's also stopped us from doing the uh, Rove to Beach Board run because, well, we, you just get sandblasted. It's that simple. So that'll have to happen on another occasion. So we've decided to come inland, head up towards the national parks and see what we can find on the inland section of this part of South Australia. Anyway, that's... Uh, all I can tell you for now until we find more stuff to show you. So, um, see you then. All right, we've arrived at the information section of Bull Lagoon. So I'll give you a quick look at it. Bull Lagoon is a game reserve. So it's controlled by Parks SA. There's some booking fees, some permits, all that kind of stuff. There's some walks. There's a campsite if you want to camp. It's too early for us to be camping anywhere near here today. There's all the information on the boards. Bull Lagoon Game Reserve. There's a whole bunch of history about it on this sign here. So, telling you how it's progressed over time. Well, I'm sure you can look it up as it is a significant site for uh, wetlands. It's World Heritage listed, as I may have mentioned previously. It's got all sorts of species of animals. So, somewhere to come and have a look at if you're in the middle of nowhere here in South Oz. So. Not silly far from Narkoot, where the national parks are, I think. The rest of it's just all the usual info boards, what to do, explore Lagoon Edge, take a quiet walk at the edge of the lagoon, watching for waders, scurrying through the shallows, the greaves diving, the swampings amongst the reeds, look at the plants, so yeah, you know, all that stuff, bird watching, camping, picnicking. So, apparently there's a good view of the lagoons from a place called Big Hill. So we might go up there and have a look. But, uh, yeah, I'll take you out here to this little lookout area that we've got here. But I'm not sure it gives you a, uh, a good enough view of anything just from here, other than the start of one of the walks and pictures of the things you can see. So that's the kind of things that you can see from here. Brogas, black swans, egrets, tea trees, bulrushes. Uh, it's a bit like a savannah kind of thing. That's all that stuff over there. So, we might go for a wander up the big hill and have a look at that. 
and see what we can see. We're not going to spend too much time trying to walk around and look at bird life and things. We've got a few other places we'd like to try and get to today. But yeah, we're just having a quick look at this area, seeing how we're here. We've made it to the top of Big Hill to have a look out across the area. Excuse the sunnies guys, they're staring straight at the sun. So I will give you a look at it as much as I can with a GoPro. So it's a, like I said earlier, it's a very big, vast, savannah styled wetland out in the middle there that your camera may not pick up it looks like a flock of something you hear some bird life and it just goes on and on and on these lagoons they just keep going and then yeah, this hill is sort of like an island because when you go across the wheel tracks here there's some more of it over there it's the same deal, it's just more wetlands. And it does eventually lead back to farmland over that way. But uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting little spot. Just this big wetland in the middle of nowhere, really. So if you're into your bird watching or you're coming to check out animals and things, it might be worth you spending a bit more time here than I'm planning to. There's a drive around to Little Bull Lagoon that apparently takes you about 45 minutes. So, it's a big enough place. This big hill's only 5Ks from where we started our uh, excursion today in this park. So, if you're in the area, I'd suggest you come and have a look at it. Because it's, uh, it's not bad. Speaking of not bad, look, Kaz is doing anything with a the shot. There she is, standing up there on the step. Because she's vertically challenged, she feels she can get a better view from there. That extra foot and a half. Anyway, that is a look over the Bull Lagoon wetlands. Narracourt Caves National Park World Heritage Area. So, this is pretty interesting. Go and check this out. Got some pretty cool sculptures of fossils at the entry. So, I think they're pretty cool. You shouldn't miss these. There's massive signs to make sure you know where you're going. So you got the big streets on here, Narcoot Caves, the Wanambi Fossil Centre, get in by cuppers up there. So we're going to go up for a look. We start out at the Wanambi Visitors Centre. This is it from the outside. So looking at the information now. Uh, the tools cost different amounts if you want to do a guided tour. I'm not sure if you can do any selfing tools or not. That's what we'll find out when we get in here. When you come into the visitor centre, you get all this kind of signage to tell you about things. Some stuffed. Well, they look stuff, they might be just very tired uh, animals there. And all the usual kind of things like representations of fossils, squishing other fossils. And so on. Uh, all sorts of things going on there. And there is tools of the Santa, but we're not doing that just yet. We're going to go and do a cave tour first, so we might look at that later, maybe. 
Well, I couldn't film a lot in the caves, as you'd imagine. And there's a lot more places we could have gone. But all these places charge you for every cave, as you'd expect. Every tour. So, yeah, you've either got to spend a fair bit of money and or a fair bit of time. Neither of which we've got. So, if we ever did one cave tour, it's pretty good. And uh, we'll see what else the area's got to offer. Well, after a pretty fun day checking out the caves and the general vicinity, we've come to this camp spot here, which is called Cockatoo Lake. I will give you a look at it. And first of all, we are the only ones here. So that's cool. It's also a free slash donation camp fillet that is a donation box so we'll chuck some dollars in that but you get a lot of it we camped right at the edge of a lake you can't swim in this lake so there was people who were swimming earlier when we got in but it's just a pretty spot to camp so, the rest of today is realistically just going to be us sitting by the lake here, having a couple of drinks in the camp, and planning what we're up to tomorrow. So, if I don't film any more today, I'll catch up with you tomorrow. If I do film more today, I'll see you then.